uh, I think uh, I will go ahead and get started then, Margaret, if that uh, sounds reasonable to you. Yes, please, go ahead. Great. Okay, well, well, thank you to everybody who's uh, joined the meeting this evening. Uh, I hope that you were able to, uh, to join uh, either by, by video conference or by phone without too much trouble. Uh, we really do appreciate the opportunity to present this evening. Um, in terms of the agenda, just quickly to walk through that, uh, we'll start by kind of laying out uh, a bit of an overview of the, the agenda, the rules of engagement for this meeting. Uh, then we'll go into our formal presentation uh, where we'll walk through some slides that we've prepared uh, there are a number of topics that are, uh, we're required to uh, cover in this presentation, both by uh, CCC or State of Massachusetts rules, as well as local uh, regulations. And so we'll cover all of those topics uh, during this presentation. Uh, we will then go into uh, a Q&A format. Uh, I'll walk through kind of how that will work uh, in, in the next few slides. Um, so just to kick it off here, uh, the, the key people on the presentation today are myself. My name is Ankur Rungta. I'm the CEO of C3 Industries. Uh, we are the applicant here uh, for this proposed site. Uh, my co-host today is Christian Janice. He's our uh, business development associate. Uh, he'll be helping me uh, with the Q&A portion uh, and managing uh, the overall video conference. Our IT manager, Melissa Beckett, is also on. Uh, she will be able to help with any IT-related issues. Uh, if you do have any IT related questions during the meeting itself, uh, you can email the email that was provided in the meeting notice and she'll be monitoring that uh, just to be able to answer any, any questions. You can also use the chat box for any questions like that. And then lastly, we have Margaret as well, who is the moderator of the meeting. Uh, she's the town administrator of Berlin. Uh, the rules uh, for these meetings do require that we bring in an unaffiliated moderator. And the recommendation is typically that it's someone that's affiliated with the town. And so uh, Margaret will help us sort of keep the conversation moving in a, in a linear direction. Uh, if there are follow-up questions or any, uh, any sort of management of the discussion needed, she will be uh, helping with that part of it. Um, as far as uh, the rules today, uh, how we'll be approaching this, um, during the actual presentation piece of this, uh, we'll keep everybody's line muted. Uh, then we'll open it up for Q&A after uh, our presentation is done. And we will actually go through uh, in sort of an order of asking first people that have dialed by phone uh, to ask if they have any questions. And we'll read out uh, each phone number for each person that's joined the call uh, and, and give them an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, we'll then uh, take questions both by the raise hand function in Zoom, as well as any that are submitted uh, via the chat box function during the meeting. Um, so the intention is that everybody uh, that would like to ask questions will be given the opportunity to, and certainly we'll try to get through the materials fairly quickly so that we can leave uh, more time for the Q&A period and, and to take feedback from, from the audience. Um, just the last point here, um, you may have heard of this idea of Zoom bombing or, or meeting disruptions. Um, we will be sensitive to that. We'll try to uh, uh, take all questions and comments, but uh, if there is sort of uh, inappropriate behavior or vulgar language, uh, then we may uh, be forced to disable the, the, the uh, or mute the line in that case. Uh, we hope that this will not come up, but I just do want to mention it. Um, the other thing I will just also mention here is our goal today is really to try to focus on the substance of our application and specifically the site that we're proposing, our background as operators, um, and, and really, we're, we're not looking to have a, a debate over the uh, overall legality of marijuana. Um, certainly, we'll welcome comments from, from folks in the audience, uh, but, uh, but the intention is to try to focus on things like the site, us as the operator, and the various aspects of our proposal here today. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a Q&A period. Uh, we will kind of cycle through first with folks that are on the, the phone, and then we'll go to people that have joined by Zoom to answer any questions that are posed uh, via the chat function or uh, by raising the hand. Uh, as far as accessibility goes, uh, there are uh, some accessibility features that we'd like to point out here. Uh, first of all, there is closed captioning uh, uh, available for this and to access that, uh, if you click the up arrow on the closed caption button near the bottom and then click show subtitles, that will allow you to see the closed captioning. 
there are also keyboard accessibility uh, features within Zoom. Uh, those can be accessed by clicking on the caption button, then the subtitle settings, and then uh, click on the keyboard. Uh, lastly, you can also view the transcript uh, as we're going through the meeting today, uh, if you'd like to read along. Uh, so that's available by, by, available by clicking on the closed caption button and then view full transcript. Uh, so those are the, the general meeting rules. Uh, now we'll get into our presentation. Um, as I mentioned, that there is a lot of information in here and some of it is, is more for reference purposes. And so I won't cover every single topic in the interest of time. Um, we have made these meeting materials available on our website. Uh, so if there are, you know, if somebody has a more specific question or any follow up on anything that we're not covering in detail here, certainly we can discuss that in the Q&A or with questions after. Uh, so just to dive into the, the, the main uh, purpose of the meeting here today. So uh, our company, C3 Industries, is a vertically integrated operator of licensed cannabis facilities. Uh, about six months ago, we entered into an agreement to lease a 5,000 square foot unit at 64 Banner Road in Berlin. Uh, based on our review of the zoning bylaws and also as confirmed by the town of Berlin building inspector, uh, this site does allow for cannabis retail use uh, pursuant to a special permit approval as well as a site plan approval. Uh, and there are a number of reasons that we think that this site is really well suited for, for our use. And we'll go into this in more detail through the presentation. Uh, but the site is very private, uh, as you may have seen. Uh, it's surrounded by forests. Uh, the unit that we're uh, proposing to, to place this business in is in the rear of the property and is not near any other sensitive uses. Uh, such as schools or churches. Uh, the site does allow for very significant parking and the unit itself is about 5,000 square feet, which is pretty sizable and, and allows us to, to uh, engage in our business without being in too tight of a space. Uh, and the entrance to this site uh, and, and any traffic that would flow there uh, comes in through Donald Lynch Boulevard, which is a fairly commercial uh, road and, and, and provides access for many other larger retail businesses in the area. Uh, just to talk a bit about our founding team. Uh, so the company was founded by, by three of us, myself, uh, my partner Vishal, as well as my partner Joel. Uh, Vishal and I come from primarily a finance background. And so we both attended the University of Michigan uh, in the business school. I also went to law school at the University of Michigan. Uh, we went on to build careers in corporate finance. And so I was a, a corporate lawyer and an investment banker in New York for many years. Uh, Vishal worked in banking and then in private equity and then had a stint at Google as well. Uh, and then our third partner, Joel, has a really deep background in cannabis operations. Uh, and so he, he spent his formative years working in Denver, Colorado, uh, in the licensed cannabis industry there, uh, where he uh, ultimately was head of operations for uh, the largest company in that state, which is called the Green Solution. Um, so he comes with a deep background in cannabis operations and and understanding how to operate sort of uh, sizable commercial businesses in licensed markets. Uh, we've given you a couple slides here that talk about our overall company profile. Um, uh, we are active today in four states, and that's Oregon, Michigan, Massachusetts, and Missouri. And our business uh, is active both uh, on the manufacturing side of the business, so in cultivation and processing of cannabis products, and we're also active as retailers of cannabis, uh, so operating retail stores uh, in the various markets. Um, I'll point out to you, uh, in Massachusetts in particular, uh, we, are, uh, we have licensing from the state uh, for a production facility that we're building in Franklin, Massachusetts. Uh, so that will be a 37,000 square foot facility. Uh, we'll produce a full line of cannabis products at that site. Um, we've been working in Massachusetts for almost two years now uh, preparing for the construction and launch of this production facility, as well as developing uh, a couple of retail sites, one of which is this site in Berlin. So our, our goal is, uh, and our plan is to have a, a vertically integrated uh, platform in Massachusetts with both production as well as retail. And there's some more detail here as well on, on some of our production operations in, in other states besides Massachusetts. Uh, the next slide here, uh, this really talks about our retail uh, overview. Uh, so as mentioned, we do have uh, retail stores as well in these various states. Um, uh, 
Uh, and, and so uh, in Massachusetts in particular, as I mentioned, uh, we were working on, on a couple of sites. So we have uh, this site in Berlin. We also have additional locations that we're pursuing licensing for in Boston and in Natick. Uh, besides that, we do operate uh, several stores in Michigan. Uh, we have one opening in Oregon uh, in the near future, in the next 60 days or so. Uh, and then we also have five retail licenses that were granted in Missouri. And those stores will be opening towards the end of this year. Uh, and, and I just want to just stop here for a second. Uh, Mel or Christian, could you please confirm that my sound is okay? Yeah, hi, Encore. It's, it's good as long as you stay uh, close to the laptop. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to move into uh, an overview of the site itself uh, that we're proposing this for. Uh, so as I mentioned, the address is 64 Banner. Um, so the first uh, slide here uh, just shows an aerial view of the site. Uh, you can see that it's uh, back sort of to the north, northwest off of Donald Lynch Boulevard. Uh, it's tucked behind some of the other retail businesses that are back there. Uh, and there's an access road that comes off Donald Lynch and takes you back to the property. Uh, this is just a bit of a zoomed in uh, shot of the site. Uh, one thing I will note, uh, Google Maps has sort of older aerial views. Um, there there's, has been a lot of uh, work done to the exterior of the site uh, since the current owner acquired it. Um, so what you're seeing is a bit of a dated shot. Uh, and then we will show some more detailed uh, uh, overviews of how we would propose to organize the site uh, later in the presentation. Uh, this is a, a bit of a, a site look at the a site plan look at the site. So you can see again the access road coming from the bottom of the page. Uh, the parcel is fairly large. It's about seven acres in size in total. Uh, and the building, the existing building that's on the site is about 30,000 square feet. Uh, and it uh, is divided into a number of different units. And we are taking one of the units, which is about 5,000 square feet in size for, for our proposed business. Uh, this is a zoomed in look. Uh, you can see uh, the 30,000 square foot building. Uh, there are some existing features on the site uh, that we're showing here between some uh, grassy areas and some walkways. Um, and, and you can see uh, sort of the entire paved area is pretty sizable around the building. Uh, this shows the, the floor plan of the building, this, sli this slide. And so uh, as I mentioned, it's about 30,000 feet in size. We are renting a unit that's one sixth of the building or about 5,000 square feet. Uh, it sits on the, the sort of northwest corner of the building. Uh, and so if you go back up to this slide, you can sort of see uh, that the, the unit that we're taking on the top right of the building is, is tucked around on the back side uh, and facing uh, some densely, uh, some dense forests around it. Um, we've also got some pictures here for those who may not be familiar with uh, what this site looks like. Uh, the first picture on the left here is the access road itself uh, that comes in from Donald Lynch Boulevard uh, and goes to, to the building itself. Uh, the picture on the right here, uh, this is showing the south face of the building, the, the initial face that you would see when you pull into the, uh, into the site. Uh, some more pictures here. The left picture here shows the, uh, the paved area on the east of the building. This is where you would uh, drive if you're going to the back part where our unit would be. Uh, and then the picture on the right shows the actual front of our unit and what it looks like today. Um, these are a few more pictures of that side of the building, just again to, uh, to give everybody a uh, uh, an idea of what the building currently looks like. Uh, pardon me, um, I'm just gonna fix my volume for one second here. And so again, you've got uh, a view here of the road that leads to the back, uh, as well as the front face of that north side of the building where our uh, and just to clarify, as you look at the front of the building on the left side where you see the loading docks, uh, that is a separate unit of ours that uh, is currently 
occupied by a different business. Um, and so our unit would be to the right. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have uh, looked at the zoning bylaw in Berlin to confirm that this site uh, is zoned properly for this use. Uh, and we've also gotten the letter that we are showing here uh, from the building inspector, uh, which confirms that uh, from a zoning standpoint that this site does work. Um, and it is subject, any uh, cannabis use would be subject to site plan approval as well as special permit approval. Uh, and so we would go through that process uh, as we as a next step after we go through this community outreach process. Uh, we've also confirmed that the site uh, complies with all the buffer requirements in the town. Uh, and specifically, that means that it's at least 500 feet away uh, from all of the sensitive uses that are listed here. And this is, again, pursuant to the town's bylaw. Uh, in terms of the site itself, I mentioned this in the very beginning, we do really think it's quite uh, well suited for our use. Uh, it's quite separated from, from other uh, neighboring parcels because of the way that the property is tucked back in, the, in these dense woods and our unit itself is towards the back of the property. Uh, there are no other sort of sensitive uses that we think would be affected uh, by our business. Uh, there's a lot of parking available on the site as well. Uh, and so we don't see any issues with parking related or traffic related concerns. Uh, the site's easily accessible uh, from the Solomon Pond exit off the highway through Donald Lynch uh, Boulevard. And, and of course that's a major uh, a retail uh, uh, area with many other large retailers. And so we don't think that we'll cause any uh, traffic related concerns in, in, that, uh, in that thoroughfare. Um, what I'm showing here is a preliminary parking plan for the site. Um, so we have been working with Kelly Engineering, which is a civil engineering firm based in Braintree. Uh, they've looked at the site for us a little bit and we've started to put some ideas on paper of what a parking plan could look like. And this is preliminary. It has not yet been approved or vetted uh, by the town, but we have put this together uh, in what we believe to be in accordance with local uh, parking uh, uh, codes and ordinances. And so you can see the plan that we've laid out here provides for uh, in excess of 70 parking spaces uh, and allows for a very healthy amount of parking both for our business as well as the other units in the building, uh, most of which are used for warehouse or, or similar purposes, so uh, less intensive from a parking standpoint. Um, and so we will go through a process of refining this parking plan uh, to make sure that it complies with all local requirements. Uh, but this is a preliminary look at what we think we could do. Uh, and as I said, it does provide for, for an excess of 70 parking spaces. Um, uh, so I've, I've covered a lot of the points here. Uh, as I mentioned, our civil engineers will work more closely uh, with the local building department, with the planning board, as we go through our special use and site plan approval process to make sure that our parking plan is, is fully in compliance. Uh, the next section I'll talk about a little bit here is uh, the layout of the interior that we're proposing, as well as many of the requirements that the state and local rules require around security, which is a key component in our business. Uh, so the slide here shows what we're proposing as the interior layout of the, of the unit. Uh, and as you can see, the front of the unit, which is to the right, is going to be primarily retail waiting space. And so uh, any, anybody looking in from the exterior of the building through the front windows would simply see a waiting area. Uh, and then to access the retail area, you would have to be checked in uh, at the reception desk and then actually buzzed in through the door. Uh, to access the showroom where you would actually view cannabis products and purchase them. Uh, and so there'll be no visibility into the showroom from the exterior of the building. Uh, there'll be no visible cannabis products. Um, the, our, our signage uh, on the exterior will be very tightly restricted. Uh, and so this will give you a sense for how we would approach the layout. Uh, this also will go through a very thorough vetting process with the town. Uh, with the building department specifically to make sure that it meets all requirements. Uh, but uh, from a preliminary review, uh, we do believe that this type of layout will meet all requirements 
uh, and also is sort of follows best practices uh, for what we do with our other retail stores. Uh, and then you can see as you go through the retail showroom, uh, the back of the house is all the way to the left. Um, that's the uh, very secure part of the building. That's where you'll have your work area, uh, your actual vault where, you're, where you will store the, the bulk product, as well as some back of the house rooms like an office and a break room and, and other things like that. Uh, this next slide uh, is very similar. It shows the layout again, uh, but this has overlaid on top of the layout all of the various security-related components that we'll have. And so it shows the locations of our security cameras. Uh, it shows the locations of motion sensors, uh, basically the various pieces of equipment uh, that we'll need uh, from a security standpoint. And so uh, we've done this many times before with our production facilities and retail facilities. Uh, and we've got a lot of experience uh, making sure that we design the security in a way that's effective and meets all the requirements. Uh, and so we're talking more detail here about what these security requirements are. Um, and, and a lot of these, as I mentioned, are mandated by either state or local regulation. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just note a couple of key points here. The facility will be completely enclosed and secure. All exterior doors will have commercial grade locks. We have very strict policies and procedures with regard to access to the facility. And that's both for employees, contractors, as well as, well as guests or customers. Uh, we have a very you know, significant amount of video surveillance uh, that's required in these businesses. And so we have uh, cameras covering all portions of the interior. Uh, we have cameras covering all entrances and exits from the building. Uh, and so it's a very thorough uh, level of video surveillance. Uh, we're also required to uh, uh, keep backup recordings of all of our cameras for a period of 90 days uh, under state law. Uh, and so we do uh, comply with that. And so all recordings are available uh, for an extended period of time if they ever need to be reviewed. Um, we will have an alarm system with panic buttons and, and that will be third party monitored. Um, we do typically tie in our alarms and video surveillance with local law enforcement and the fire department as well. Um, and we can even provide direct access to our video camera system to law enforcement locally. Um, and then our employees are trained to sort of monitor the store exterior to make sure there's nobody uh, parking uh, inappropriately or loitering around the site. Uh, we do a pretty, uh, pretty thorough job of, of, of policing the exterior of our buildings as well. Um, uh, again, this is more detail on, on the security system. Um, a couple other key points here. We will do regular audits of our equipment, and that is, again, required by rule, but also by best practice. Uh, and so we're always checking to make sure our equipment is working. Uh, if there are any issues, we, we will have them uh, uh, corrected immediately by our, our security contractor that we work with. Um, the exterior of the building will be very well lit. Um, and so that's part of something we'll work through in the site plan process, but we will propose exterior lighting to, to light the sort of surrounding area around the building as well as the parking lot. We'll also look to try to install a security fence uh, in the area where we do shipping and receiving uh, to, to make that extra secure. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, th there is a, a third party monitored alarm system uh, one other point I'll make here is that Massachusetts as a state uh, also requires a secondary alarm system uh, for redundancy purposes. Um, so we will actually have two separate alarm systems that are both monitored by a third party company as well as by law enforcement. Um, other considerations that are relevant uh, for, for retail cannabis businesses, uh, one is odor control. Um, and so odor is always uh, something that, uh, that local and state regulation covers uh, as it does in Massachusetts. Um, we will incorporate carbon filters into our mechanical systems in the building in order to filter out any odors. Um, retail businesses for cannabis don't generate a, a whole lot of odor like the production businesses do, but even in that case, we will still use these carbon filters to make sure that any limited odor that's there uh, will be trapped before any air is exhausted to the outside. Um, we also uh, really try hard to maintain a very clean site. Uh, and so we have a, an active litter control program. And so 
uh, members of the, the team will uh, uh, do a sweep of the property, at least on a daily basis, uh, clean up any trash. Uh, we'll put trash receptacles uh, around the exterior of the site so they're available for people. Uh, and we'll try to make sure that we maintain the site in a very clean manner. Uh, I, I touched on this before, uh, but we do uh, really try to police the exterior of the site of our retail locations. And so uh, we will have uh, exterior video cameras, we'll have employees sort of monitoring outside. Uh, we'll try to actively manage uh, anybody who may be loitering or, uh, or parking uh, inappropriately. Uh, candidly, we don't expect too much of that uh, at a site like this, uh, but uh, it will not change our standard practices, will be, which will be to tightly, tightly maintain the exterior of the, of the property. Uh, another key, uh, key aspect of these businesses is, is ensuring that there's no diversion to minors of any cannabis products. Um, and so we have very strict requirements around access to the facility. Um, so all employees that we hire will be over 21 years of age, and that will be verified uh, upon hire. All guests and all visitors to the site must verify their age upon entry. Uh, we train all of our employees to on how to ch properly check identification. Um, it's very important for us to follow these rules. Um, uh, if we were to not comply with this, it could put our license in jeopardy, and, and we would never uh, uh, want to uh, you know, be part of any diversion to minors or to, uh, to, to not be properly policing this. And so we take this very seriously. Uh, we've never had any issues with this in any of our other businesses. Uh, we are as tight as it can be when it comes to checking identification and, and prohibiting any minors from entering the facility. Another important uh, discussion point here and, and one that uh, we always talk about is, is the impact on the community. Uh, because we are well aware that uh, that cannabis, that marijuana, is still uh, a view. There's a diversity of views out there on uh, on this industry, on these products, uh, and there are certainly some perspectives uh, that there could be negative impacts from our business uh, on the local community. And so we're always thinking about how can we work with communities to try to uh, make our business uh, a, a positive contributor and. And if there are any negative impacts, try to mitigate them or offset them uh, with other things that we're doing locally. Uh, and so we've, we've identified a few areas here that are, that are relevant. Um, so first and foremost, if we were to move forward, uh, we will be entering into what's called a host community agreement with the town of Berlin. And, and that will specify uh, a local tax that will be uh, collected by the town. And that's often uh, in the state of Massachusetts, that's 3% of gross revenue is typically uh, what that what that local fee is, which can be a fairly substantial uh, amount of money, depending on the revenue that the business uh, uh, does at that site. Uh, so we will be entering into that agreement and, and agreeing to that uh, local fee. Um, we also are are planning and we will commit to hiring most of our employees from the local area. Um, that's an important uh, consideration for us and something that we think is also just a good business practice for a retail business like this. Um, we will also be uh, committing to certain positive impact and diversity plans uh, with the state as part of our state licensing application. And part of those plans will involve uh, using hiring and other tools to benefit local disadvantaged groups. Uh, and so that'll be something that's very important as part of our state application and will be an ongoing commitment that we'll be making uh, and will have a positive impact on the community. Uh, we've also, as a company, uh, made a commitment to a living wage for all employees. Um, so today we employ roughly about 150 employees total across our business. Uh, and, and we have made this living wage commitment. And we also provide comprehensive benefits to all of our full-time employees. And so, uh, so this is an important uh, piece of, of what we do from a hiring and employment standpoint and something that we're, we're very, very proud of. Um, so that is really everything I wanted to cover uh, in terms of our prepared materials. Uh, I hope I didn't go through it too quickly. Um, now we're going to move into the Q&A portion of, our, uh, of the presentation. And so as I mentioned, uh, we'll go through this in a certain order to try to keep it a bit uh, organized and systematic. And so Christian is going to help me uh, through this portion. And 
And where we will start is we'll first, uh, I'm not sure, I'm gonna just double check if there are any folks that have uh, uh, joined by phone, we will uh, start by reading off their phone numbers. And uh, it does not look like to me, Christian, are, can you confirm that you're not seeing anybody attending via, via phone? There are no farm participants. Okay, great. Um, so then uh, what we will do now then is, is we, will, uh, we will then move to uh, taking questions either via the chat box or via the raise hand function. Uh, I think Christian, let's please start with any questions that came in via the chat box and then we can move to raise hand uh, from there. We don't have any that came in through during the presentation, but if the participants would like to ask a question through the chat, they can do so now or they can raise their hand. Okay, great. So I, I guess if there's no questions in the chat box, could we please have uh, folks use the raise hand function now to ask questions and we will select the, the, uh, uh, the participants one by one who are raising their hands. So Johnny Quinn has a question. If uh, Mel, can you unmute Johnny Quinn? Go ahead, Johnny. So actually, I'm not Johnny. It comes up as Johnny. He's my son. Um, he uh, he teaches on this. Um, but um, I'm Ornella Quinn. And um, so my first question is, um, so from what I heard and what I've read about your company, um, you have a pretty accelerated business plan, um, especially in Michigan. And um, I've seen the same in Oregon. So um, my question is really about Massachusetts, and I, I just wanted some clarification on your slide. Um, slide number six, um, where you list under Massachusetts. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Can no, you hear me? Yep, yeah, now I can. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, do I need to start my video or no? Do you not need that? I don't, I don't know if I can. Uh, it's okay. up to you. If you'd like to, you can, but it's not necessary. Uh, unable to start it, so I'm not allowed. So, okay. So anyway, so um, under Massachusetts on slide six, you have that regulations allow for three retail stores. And, um, and then you have here that you have, I'm not sure, what is LOI in place? Again, what does LOI stand for? A letter of intent. Okay, for three initial locations. Um, and then you say you have, you're in negotiation for additional locations in Boston. So uh, you're just saying the total of those wouldn't be able to amount to more than three additional retail stores? Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and, and specifically uh, in Boston, if you're, you, you may be familiar with this, but it's a very competitive process there. Um, and uh, there, there's no guarantee of success. So we, we may not be successful with the three sites that we're currently working on. Gotcha. So this is, okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Um, so um, I guess I, I just wanted to maybe if you could clarify what your business plan really is for Massachusetts. Is it the one cultivating and manufacturing facility in Franklin and then the three retail or are you looking to do other things in Massachusetts? No, it's exactly that. So it's the facility in Franklin that we're starting construction on right now that we've been working on for the last couple of years. And then it's going to be the three retail sites as well that we're we're hoping to uh, have approved and, and build out over the next year or so. Um, so that will be the entirety of our Massachusetts platform. Okay. Um, I do have a number of questions. This other one is somewhat related to this. Should I, is it okay if I ask that or do you want me to, to hold off? No, uh, excuse me, excuse me, on, on courts, Margaret. Um, sure. Uh, in the interest of all attendees having a chance to answer questions, um, maybe Ornella could ask one more and then we could move on. I see another couple of hands up. Yeah, absolutely, Ornella. And then we can circle back to you as well after. Yeah, no problem. This yeah. other one is with, with regards to the building. And um, so I heard you say that you're leasing a 5,000 square foot 
uh, area of the building. So I imagine, and there's another business there now. So um, I'm just wondering, um, with the marijuana retail business in the building, could it uh, discourage or limit other types of businesses even looking to lease there? Just your opinion. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't think it will. So uh, I, I've got a, a, a great relationship with the owner of this property who I, who I believe is actually uh, participating in this meeting this evening. Um, they're, they actually are owner occupied. Uh, they're, they're, they're ten, they're, they occupy the building as well uh, with their landscaping business. And uh, I can tell you that they're very excited about us coming in um, and, and don't see any issues with it. So the landlord, uh, you know, themselves are, are, are kind of on the site regularly with their business. Um, there is one other uh, business there as well right now that takes about 10,000 feet in the building uh, and they're, they're very comfortable as well. So I, I believe there's only one vacant unit there um, and, and I, I, I don't think the landlord has concerns uh, about, about other businesses being deterred. Okay, all right, thank you. I'll, we'll just circle back with some other questions later. Thank you. Great, thank you. So the next person is Janez, J-A-N-E-Z. Yes. Great. Hi, Janez, thank you. Please ask your question. Okay. Yes, my name is Ellen, and I share my email with my husband, Janez. And my question regards the traffic. With the construction of 200 new apartment units being added at the Rotary, we will be seeing a substantial increase in traffic flow on River Road, given that your marijuana retail business will also create additional traffic and ease of drug accessibility. How do you intend to ensure that this location will not constitute a nuisance to the community as defined by law? And if it should, it, I know you're saying right now it should not create a problem, but if it should, what would you do to resolve it? Sure, thank, thank you for that question. Um, so as I mentioned, our preliminary uh, look at the site, we actually think that there's plenty of sort of capacity for traffic to come through from, uh, from uh, the exit off the highway into Donald Lynch Boulevard. And, and I believe the development that you're talking about uh, is further north uh, off of that, uh, off of on River Road. Um, so we, we don't think that we'll be overlapping with that traffic, but one piece that we are planning on, on doing as we get further into uh, the site plan and special use process is a, is a traffic study, a formal traffic study. Uh, and I think that will support um, um, the idea that the traffic that we will generate will not uh, materially affect what's already happening there. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, there are some very large retailers uh, off of Donald Lynch there between Best Buy, all the stores in the mall, uh, and, and some of the other large big box retail that's there. So uh, I, I don't see us making a, a material difference there. We're, uh, we're, we're very similar to sort of some other, other uh, uh, small retail businesses uh, like this of similar size. And, and one, other, one other point that I'll make is, um, by the time we open a store here, if we're successful in doing that, uh, there will be many, many more stores open around the state of Massachusetts. And I think uh, some of the initial uh, uh, novelty of this or uh, the, the people that are traveling from far distances to come to a store, uh, some of that I think will go away as, the, as more of the state fills in and there are more options available to people. Um, if we if we do a traffic study and it turns out there are traffic related issues to, to answer the other part of your question, uh, we would be willing to uh, to do things to try to mitigate that. And so uh, a couple of ideas that we would explore in that situation is one would be an appointment only type of approach. If 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 it if if there's too much traffic generated uh, by folks just coming, uh, uh, you know, at any time, uh, we can set an appointment only type of approach, and that is what some other stores in Massachusetts have done, uh, particularly when they first open, if there's a large uh, interest and a large amount of visitors in the, in the beginning. Um, a couple of other things that, that we've done in the past is uh, trying to um, uh, encourage uh, some of our employees to carpool, so we limit traffic that way. Uh, we can encourage them to use public transportation as well, and in one of our locations in Boston, we've actually agreed to subsidize uh, public transportation. I think here that, me, me, but, um, 
well, uh, my concern is also the traffic may come in from River Road West from other towns on the west side. Sure. Have you considered yeah. that? Yeah, I, I, I think we would expect the vast majority of the traffic to either be very local or to come off of the highway. Um, uh, but a traffic study will would explore that a little bit more. But but we don't our our traffic generation um, would be far far less than the businesses that are immediately surrounding us in that area. Um, so so for example, the Best Buy uh, that that is right in front of our site, uh, or some of those other large stores, they generate far far more traffic than we do. And so I I can't see our uh, customers you know, adding to that in any significant way, just given again, there's such a concentration of large retail there, including the mall itself. Um, and again, the, I think the data from a traffic study would, would support. Uh, I think part of the Berlin bylaw uh, in that, in the site plan process, uh, we will likely be asked to do a traffic study and that will formally lay out this data. All right, if I could ask just one, two more little questions. Please. Um, unrelated to the traffic now, um, under a litter control um, and um, under one of the bullets, C3 Industries will also identify ways to reduce waste output through packaging reduction efforts. Um, where will you be dumping uh, the, the Berlin Transfer Station? Uh, where will we be dumping as in, uh, as in uh, getting rid of our trash? Is, is yes. Um, so we'll contract with a with a trash removal company, just like uh, any other business would, and and I believe we would likely do that in conjunction with our neighboring tenants on that site because it is a larger building. Um, so we would use standard sort of waste removal services. Uh, the only nuance there is that specifically, if we were throwing away any cannabis products themselves, uh, the actual product, uh, then there are some additional rules that apply in terms of how we dispose of those. Uh, and so uh, that's a small nuance, but uh, from, from the community standpoint, um, the, the trash removal will be no different than, than any other business. Okay, and just one more quick, if there anybody, I hope nobody objects, um, uh, uh, loitering and parking under that, um, um, loiter, loitering and parking. Property will be kept neat and well-maintained, that referring to your property, and um, all that is all well and good, but my concern is um, trash from your customers leaving, being thrown on the sides of the streets and our streets. Um, with this COVID-19, I've seen face masks on the side of the roads. How do you address this issue with customers? I know you probably don't have control over the customers after they leave, but that is a very big concern of mine. Sure. Um, I, I think uh, it's a totally, uh, reasonable concern. I, I think what you'll find is that uh, our cannabis packaging has some pretty specific rules around it. And so when people buy products from our stores, uh, it is it is in tamper proof containers. Uh, it's typically put in a bag that is not uh, see through. And so it's being given to the customers in a format uh, where I it's hard to imagine that, you know, they'll be throwing out the containers that the products actually come in uh, as they leave the site. Um, certainly, there's always. They probably will because I see trash on our side street. They throw stuff out the window. They don't care. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I was having trouble hearing you at the very end. I said that, um, people do throw things out the windows, uh, no matter where they are. It, it's really sad. Sure. No, and, and I totally appreciate that. I, I, certainly, that risk could exist from some of our customers, just like a customer of any retail business could could litter, but. I don't think there's anything particular about our business that uh, would would sort of uh, create more of that happening. And if anything, because of how our products are packaged and some of the regulations there, I think if anything, you may see that there's a little bit of less of that uh, because of the way these products are packaged and how they come to the customer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Janine Mackey. Hi, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for such a detailed and um, great presentation. I appreciate it. And um, I'm also pretty supportive of your, your endeavor. So um, thank you. Thank you. And 
the the thing the question that I had I think has mostly been answered. Um, I was a little concerned about the area that you're talking about where uh, folks will be pulling off of Donna Lynch Boulevard onto the property um, and then pulling back out again. That can be kind of a tricky intersection. Sometimes it's a little bit of a curve there and it can be difficult to see. Um, but I'm heartened to hear about your traffic study. Um, and so I'm assuming then if, if issues do arise with that and we do find that that is causing problems um, that you'll work to address that. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that's what that more detailed uh, site plan review and special use process will, will cover. Um, I, I think it'll be a very detailed look at what we're proposing on the site, parking, traffic, the interior layout. Um, and so again, if there, are, if there are changes that we need to make or you know, anything that we need to add at that entrance point uh, to, 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 you know, to mitigate some of those issues, we'll absolutely do it. That's great, thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Peg. Peg, if um, yep. oh, there, we go. Oh, there you are. All set. Thanks so much. Thank you. I had a question. Um, you talked a little bit um, earlier about benefits to the communities. And I know that there will be a, a certain amount of money that will come back to Berlin, which will obviously be a huge help um, in the budget that we're in, especially with COVID and all the impacts. But could you go into a little bit more detail about benefits uh, overall to the town besides the tax base? Sure. Um, I think the main benefits are around uh, local hiring and sort of wages and other benefits that we provide. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, we, we will uh, set a target for local hiring, meaning we'll try to hire uh, a specific portion of our management and employee staff uh, from the local community. Um, and then we'll also offer, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a living wage commitment. So our typical compensation um, can range anywhere from $15 an hour up to $21 an hour. Uh, and then we also will have at a, at a location like this we would have likely anywhere from four to six salaried employees. And those salaried employees would be compensated between $45,000 and $70,000 a year. Uh, and then all full-time employees, whether hourly or salaried, uh, receive a benefits package as well. So that's one of the main areas that we like to focus. We, we're also open, what we've done in certain other communities, and, and we haven't yet gotten into this discussion in Berlin, but. Uh, we are open to supporting other local efforts um, that can take the form of, of law enforcement uh, priorities that can be uh, parks and recreation type of uh, support that we've done before. Um, so we are open to providing more support. I will say that um, candidly, there's been a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, discussion in Massachusetts around all of this and um, I think that where the state is coming out is that uh, that the local communities are sort of restricted from taking uh, other financial benefits uh, beyond the local tax, which is 3% of the gross revenue. Um, so there may be some constraints uh, that we have to think about there, uh, but there are many other ways that we can get involved, uh, like volunteering in the community, sponsoring local community events. Uh, and so those are all things that we're open to and I think would be fleshed out uh, in this host agreement process that we would be going to next, uh, assuming that uh, the community wishes for us to move forward. That's awesome. Thank you. That's uh, specifically what I was hoping uh, that you would say into doing some type of community service outreach uh, to folks that are in town. So thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. We have Ms. Quinn again. Great. Mel, are we able to uh, unmute that line, please? Yep, I asked her to unmute. There we go. Oh, great. Be good. Yeah, I clicked it. It just, I think uh, the my wow. mouse was stuck. So thanks. No problem. Um, sure you want to unmute me though? All right. So um, 
Um, so my, my next question um, actually um, comes from the heels of what Peg just asked you. So um, it is financially based. So just bear with me. I have a little tiny bit of background, but um, before I do that, I did want to ask you, do you expect your revenue, your revenue to be per year, let's say in a year? Carolyn. Great, great question. S same, uh, same question that my investors ask me sometimes. Um, the, uh, there are, I think it sort of depends, it, it will change over time. And by that, I mean, uh, over time, more and more stores are going to be opening around the state. Um, and you'll also have uh, neighboring states uh, creating licensed cannabis programs. So I think uh, it will change over time. I think our rough estimate um, in the in sort of a the near term first year type of thing is we think we can do something like four to five million dollars of revenue uh, okay. from, from this location. And so, uh, just simple math: if there's a three percent uh, local tax that's charged on that, if it's five million dollars, uh, that would be one hundred fifty thousand dollars flowing to the community. So, um, and and how did you come up with that figure? That's based on what we've seen in some of our other locations. Um, that's based on our, there, there's a lot of data out there on the Massachusetts market. So you can, uh, there's data available on sort of the overall market size. There's data available on how many stores are operating. So you can certainly right. get some quick average type of numbers. And then uh, beyond that, then of course, location plays a huge uh, factor in this. So uh, if, you're in, if you're in Boston or very dense areas around Boston, uh, certainly that would suggest a higher revenue potential right. if you're in a more non-commercial or uh, uh, less densely populated area than, than you, you would expect right. less. Right. I mean, it's because some of the figures I was seeing would be a much lower um, so that the town would actually be around between 60 and 75,000 in, in taxes. So, so with that in mind, I mean, that's just my opinion based on what some others in demographics like are making. But um, with that in mind, um, I just wanted to, um, your company is based in Michigan. Um, I wanted to share with you some Massachusetts related concerns. Um, so rep our representative, Hannah Kane, she's a rep for uh, Shrewsbury and uh, Westbury. She shared her concerns recently with uh, Governor Baker um, and they coincide with Boston Globe report um, this past month. And it details that since July of 2018, None of the $67 million in marijuana excise taxes that the state has received. Um, none of the monies left over after paying the cost of regulation, regulators in the state have funded any new initiatives or supported um, any of the purposes prescribed in the state law, public safety, and Excuse aid me. to community. Artists. Excuse me, Ornella. Um, what is, um, pardon me for interrupting. I'm just trying to facilitate. We've, we've no, gone over... We've gone over three minutes. I'm just wondering what your question, what's your, what's your question? I'm getting it to my question and I, okay. I appreciate it. So I did, I did preface this. I did ask him some questions regarding revenue. So I did allow him to speak. So now I'm coming back with um, some very serious concerns. So as far as the state goes, no funds have been used to address impaired driving and marijuana consumption amongst teenagers. Our police chiefs are saying they still have any money to train officers on detecting stone driving. Schools have not benefited from funds to educate students about the potential harms of cannabis. And many schools with the rise in marijuana vaping and changing attitudes about pot, as you've mentioned, lack the resource to respond um, in any way besides suspensions. Now, all of those concerns together, they are a concern, but of course, they're also a local concern, right? Because these things are happening in our community. So my question to you is that given that any financial gain, we can call it 70,000 a year to the town of Berlin, okay? Will like not offset these financial societal costs to our town. So I have heard you speak about how you want to particularly impact the community such as hiring local employees and giving their wages and uh, benefits to your full-time employees. And I, while I appreciate that, um, I do believe that's a general practice, but how do you plan to really positively the community and offset those things that I've just mentioned? So there you go. Got it yeah, all in. No, 
Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Look, I think I'll start by saying uh, how the state is allocating the funds they receive in taxes is is certainly far beyond my control or our, our company control. Um, we, our, my understanding is that the local taxes that taxes that be collected in, as part of the host agreement, uh, those flow directly to the community. Um, certainly, there are different perspectives on what is the harm that a business like ours brings, and I think that. I, I'm sure played out um, in the local process when the decision was made to allow cannabis businesses in Berlin. Um, I will tell you from my perspective, the benefit of our business is far outweigh the harms and that's beyond the financial benefits. And, and by that, I mean, that I mean, currently what you have in a place like Berlin and, and many communities is a thriving black market thriving. products. And uh, that black market often has products that are very unsafe for people. There's no testing done on those products. Um, there's often a very limited variety of what's available, meaning they're often smokable products when many people are seeking healthier, non-smokable versions of cannabis for, for various uh, considerations. And so uh, to me, there is no question that providing a licensed, uh, regulated channel for people to acquire cannabis is, is far preferred to the alternative, which is engaging in black market transactions that could be dangerous and then buying products that uh, people aren't really sure of what they're getting or whether they're safe. And, and so I think that, frankly, if it were up to me, I think having a licensed channel, having uh, proper information and transparency out there for consumers is far preferred to the alternative, which is uh, what, what often currently exists, which is you know, far less information and and a far less regulated marketplace uh, where these things are, are purchased. As far as our, our you know, specific contributions, um, as I said, I'm very open to, uh, to trying to think of, of more specific ways to benefit the local community. If there are specific priorities that the community has, uh, whether it's, it's about uh, uh, education of children when it comes to cannabis, uh, whether it's, you know, other uh, law enforcement priorities, whatever the concerns may be, uh, I think that is what the host ag agreement process is for, is to flesh those out and determine how and where can a business like ours be helpful. Uh, but I will say that, uh, generally speaking, even if there were not these financial benefits, I still think that we add value to the community. I still think that there's real utility in allowing properly regulated properly run cannabis businesses uh, to, to, to function. Uh, and, and then on top of that, we absolutely uh, try to uh, uh, partner with the communities that we're in. We try to be active and positive contributing members of the community. Um, we are not uh, uh, looking to sort of unilaterally force businesses and these our businesses into communities that don't want them. Um, so we're, we're really trying to do things the right way. And I think we've built a pretty strong reputation and track record of doing that. Um, and, and, and certainly every community is different. So we will uh, go through that same process in Berlin. But, uh, but generally speaking, I, I do really think that uh, the, the, the negative impacts of our business are fairly limited. And I would argue there are some pretty strong positive impacts that, uh, that are often not thought about as much when, when these conversations are being had. Well, I do appreciate your answer. And of course, we know I'm probably going to disagree with the benefits far outweighing them, but, uh, but far outweighing negative, because they are seeing, unfortunately, um, in areas where marijuana is, is, um, is sold. Excuse and me. It, Excuse me, Ornella. There's a, another caller another, here, another participant who's been waiting um, for quite a while um, with, with a hand up. So I'd like to, can we just. Um, um, move on to her for a moment and come back to you. No, absolutely. I, I apologize. Unmuted me. I thought it was so that I could respond. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Th thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Arnold. Christian. Uh, Ellen. Uh, yes. Yes. yes, Ellen. Yes, thank you. Just one little comment um, on the po positive impact on community, quote unquote. I'm perfectly honest. And I'm speaking for myself. I see no positive impact on this community. It really makes me sad for people using drugs as a positive impact. That's all I want to say. Thank you. I have something I want to say. I don't know how to put my hand up. 
Sure, please go ahead, Barbara. Um, uh, I, uh, um, we have been through the drug scene with two of my cousins and uh, it started with marijuana maybe when they were in junior high. Uh, and now uh, it's of course beyond, gone beyond that. But what I, uh, my question is, what will your products that you sell look like? Will they entice young people like my cousins? That's a great question. Um, so there are very strict rules in Massachusetts around packaging of these products and what can go on the packaging. And very specifically, there are restrictions on uh, any packaging or logos or branding that are designed to appeal to minors. And every piece of packaging, every design that's used on a product actually has to go through an approval process with the state regulator. It's a very involved process. Um, and so they're thoroughly looking at, at, these, at what these, pa these products look like in the packaging and, and restricting that significantly. Um, we will carry in the store a variety of different products. And so uh, you'll have uh, all kinds of different categories. So you could have uh, cannabis flower, you can have edible products, uh, you can have, uh, 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 you can have uh, topicals and tinctures, which are creams and different things. So they, they will take many different formats. And so the actual boxes that they go in will look different depending on which type of product you're talking about. But uh, the state is very, very tight on how you can market um, uh, cannabis, cannabis products. Uh, we're very restricted on what we can put on our signage on the exterior of the building. Uh, and, and then, you know, the other point I'll mention, which I, I think is nice about this site, is that you would really never go back into this location unless you are coming to shop there. It is not an area that has through traffic. It's very tucked back and our suite is in the rear part of the building. And so uh, one, I think, uh, uh, nice sort of side effect of that is you'll have very limited sort of traffic of passerbys uh, looking at the store and, and wondering, uh, you know, or, or trying to uh, get access to it if they're not allowed. So, uh, so I think the location helps and then the state rules are very tight on this particular subject. Do your products include gummy bears? No. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Quinn? Hi. Um, uh, but you don't have gummy bears or happy gummy squares. <laughs> Will you be selling things such as that? I'm sorry. I, I know that I, I know Massachusetts allows that and, and it's, you know, they'll probably be, I'm assuming. Uh, we don't plan on carrying gummy bears or gummy squares. Where okay. Can, good, good. Candidly, we'll okay. carry in a full, we'll, we'll carry an array of products in the store. Um, some that we will manufacture, some that third parties will manufacture. We, we don't produce every product internally of, of, of every single category. Uh, so there will be a mix, but there will be none that will be uh, uh, branded or marketed or packaged or designed to appeal to minors. Right, I, I appreciate that. But you, I'm sure you do understand why why we're asking those kind of questions because your products, I'm sure. And, and I appreciate that you won't be selling anything that looks like, you know, cars and colas and things that kids would be drawn to. Um, it really wasn't a question. <laughs> I just, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, th this goes back to you know, the state has passed a very robust framework for how they license and regulate these businesses. It's incredibly detailed. I would, I would, you know, say, and I hope it's not controversial, that we are the most regulated industry in the country right now, um, which, which is totally fine. I, it's not surprising given that it's a new industry. Uh, there's still a lot of concern around it. Uh, I get all of those things, but I think a lot of what you're getting at is, is goes to the inherent fact that the state has passed this framework and there are all kinds of rules and safeguards built into it. Um, uh, but, but certainly, uh, you know, th there may be aspects of that framework that, uh, that not everybody agrees with, but uh, there is a very, very detailed system of rules. And, and I would even say, having now done this in multiple states, Massachusetts is one of the, the more uh, 
uh, uh, thoughtful and frankly more restrictive set of regulations uh, compared to many of the other states, particularly on the West Coast where there are looser regulations around these things. So that actually wasn't my question, so forgive me, but I, I always wanted to comment on the last question. Um, so we had a Massachusetts state trooper, um, father of Thomas Clardy of Hudson. Um, he was uh, killed by a, a, I don't know what I'm looking at there. Um, he was killed by, um, by a uh, driver who was under the influence of marijuana. Um, he lived next door to us in Hudson. Um, now the driver had purchased medical marijuana at, at uh, Netta, Brookline. Uh, just hours before the crash. So, um, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they're seeing a trend of more accidents in states that commercialized marijuana, and the number of fatal vehicle crashes in which drivers test positive more than doubled from 2007 to 2016, rising from 8 to 18 percent. So, my question is, how will our community be protected from the public health and safety harms of the products that you yeah, look, I, I think uh, it's interesting. I will uh, probably I'll ask be, Margaret to weigh in on, you know, in on, you know these broader community considerations and whether uh, Berlin should have legalized this product. You know, as she mentioned, this is probably not the forum for that. But um, what I will say is that uh, there is a lot of data out there, and, and I'm not exactly familiar with which study you're pointing to, but I could point you to several that uh, that have come out in states like Colorado and Oregon and Washington uh, that have shown that legalized cannabis does not cause an increase in usage levels, does not cause an increase in crime in the surrounding areas, uh, does not cause an increase in uh, traffic related uh, incidents. And so certainly it's, it's still early on. We're only about uh, you know, 10, 10 or so years into a legalized cannabis industry in this country. But um, I think there's a lot of very compelling data that uh, that goes in the other direction. Uh, but but look, I think this goes to uh, the general discussion around whether cannabis should be legal and how it should be regulated, both in Berlin and in Massachusetts more broadly. And and I will just ask that we sort of move past that because I don't know that's exactly what we're focusing on here today. Excuse me. This is um, this is Margaret, and and yes, the community um, outreach meeting, according to the CCC's guidelines, is for the purpose of the proponent explaining the proposed marijuana establishment use and provide information about potential impacts to the neighborhood and community. Um, it's a forum to ask questions and discuss relevant issues related to the proposed marijuana establishment, but it's not to debate the legality of marijuana. Um, I do see another hand up. Yep, Peter Hoffman. Hi, Peter. All right, there we go. How are you? Good, thank you. I seem to not have video. Anyway, thanks for your presentation. I'm involved with the economic development of the town, and I appreciate your presentation. I support new business, good business. Uh, there we go. Anyway, uh, and I support new business. I'm not opposed to cannabis, but I am opposed to vagaries. Uh, for example, you talked about um, a living wage, but you're not specific. So going forward, as you proceed through the, the labyrinth of this process, at least in this town, I'd appreciate it if you were specific. For example, what a living wage is considered to be in this community, this region, this state, or even in this town and other sort of marketing-esque comments make it a little difficult to judge and makes it feel a little less genuine. So if you could address what a living wage would be defined as and some of the other um, generalizations, I'd appreciate it. Thanks again for coming to our town. Sure, no, thank you, Peter. Um, I think part of what you're pointing to is, is reflect where we are in the process. Uh, and so before I respond specifically to your questions, I'll kind of uh, maybe kind of review that quickly. So uh, the community outreach process is really kind of on the front end of, of how these cannabis processes work. And so uh, the next steps were we to kind of move forward from here would be one, to negotiate a host community agreement, and then two, to go through a site plan and special use approval process with the local community. Um, so there will be uh, a long process ahead of fleshing out all of the details of this 
and then committing to them in writing uh, in a contract form. Um, when we think about living wage, certainly there are many different perspectives on what that constitutes. And, and like you said, it can vary significantly by region. Um, so just to be very specific, our entry level hourly employees in our retail stores get paid $15 an hour and it can escalate up from there, as I mentioned, to $21 an hour. Our salaried employees and retail businesses like this make between $45,000 and $70,000 a year. And all full-time employees, which are employees that work 30 hours or more, are, uh, are, can participate in our benefits plan, which is health, dental, and vision. Um, so that, that is very specifically what we offer. If, Where do we, I get an application? I'm sorry? Where do I get an application? Just kidding. <laughs> they will be available. Um, but look, we are, we are absolutely trying to uh, build long-term uh, uh, teams for all of these facilities. We are looking to minimize turnover. Um, we really want to build a great, great uh, locally-based staff. And so uh, all of what I just described to you will, uh, will be put into written commitment format. And I suspect that would either be in the HCA or as a condition of our special use approval if it's ultimately granted. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Miss Quinn. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, Unfortunately, I think um, there's been a lot of misinterpreting of his I'm asking. Um, I, I'm looking at a, a company wanting to come into our town, right? And we need to make sure this is something that will positively impact us and not bring more harm than good. So that's why I'm asking the questions I'm asking. So, um, so while we can dispute studies and dispute whether there is or not, uh, the truth of the matter is they have been stated by our surgeon and they have been stated by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So that being said, I have to be aware that this is not just a normal commodity that you are coming into our time to sell. I mean, we can agree on that, I'm sure. Um, so. I'm trying to dig a little deeper to, to see what you feel your responsibility is to really help curb the harms that we know as a nation have been caused. We see the increase in adolescence use by 30%. We see them being diagnosed in Boston at Boston Children's Hospital, an increase of 8% being diagnosed adolescents with cannabis use disorder. You, that's Dr. Sharon Levy, she's here all the time. So those are my concerns because you're bringing this product, le and when I say legal, got it, and I, I, I get all that. But what we're discussing here is how it's being legalized. And, and you know, we're, we're stating our concerns, and I do believe that that's what this meeting is. So, yes. So my question to you, and the last one wasn't really aired, um, I just got reprimanded, but the question I had asked in my last one was, um, first paper, um, is, is, is how do you plan on protecting our public health and safety? But this particular question I'm asking now, I guess we can try to lump it together, um, but, but I, I do want to better understand what are your education, your advertising, social awareness plans, and I understand this is front end, but I guess I would like to hear from you that you do intend on having um, some education, advertising, social awareness plans to protect our community's youth from this kind of marketing exposure. We know it's happening, the proof is there, we don't need to dispute that. But what do you feel your responsibility is um, as someone coming in from Michigan Right. We're not just, you're not just my neighbor down the street wanting to open up a little shop. You are a, a exactly. business and I commend you on that. You've done amazing work in, um, you have a very good business model. You've done great in Michigan. And, and I know you have plans for 20 more dispensers in the next 24 months. Awesome, 
business plan. And I, I do commend you. I look at that and I see that aggressive growth. Um, it concerns me. It concerns me because I do have to ask, what are your plans for Massachusetts? And, and, and to protect our youth. And that's what I'd like to hear from you. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, I think uh, part of what you're hearing from us is is absolutely, absolutely. From, for concerns and considerations and feedback from the community. Uh, I think that when you go into the territory of sort of uh, generally what should the industry be doing or how should it be regulated, I think that's uh, where it's, you know, those are, those are sort of uh, outside of uh, our control and, and the purview of the discussion. But let, let me just answer or try my best to. Um, I think we absolutely have a lot of responsibility as cannabis businesses. I think liquor companies have a lot of responsibility. I think a lot of, uh, I think uh, prescription drug manufacturers and, and sellers have a lot of responsibility. There are a lot of businesses in our society that have uh, pros and cons associated with them. And, and I, take, I take our responsibility in the cannabis industry very seriously. And so we often joke that our whole business is a compliance business because First and foremost, we are subject, as I mentioned, to probably the strictest regulatory frameworks of any businesses in the U.S. And so really what we pride ourselves on is following the rules, doing it the right way, partnering with communities as best we can, trying to alleviate concerns if and when they come up, and adjusting our plans and our designs and our proposals based on feedback from the community. Um, so we take that very seriously. You know, I, I started my career as a corporate lawyer. Uh, being an, an attorney is kind of what's informed my whole approach to life. And, and I very believe very strongly in, in sort of rules and frameworks. And, and I've spent now a lot of time, I think, with some of the town staff in Berlin and, and certain members of the community. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, my approach, my, uh, my set of values is coming across because I, I do take a lot of pride in it. And I think uh, as far as different cannabis companies go, I think we are as responsible as, as anyone out there. Um, so certainly it will be uh, you know, our responsibility to follow the rules, to do things the right way. I cannot uh, sit here and tell you that we can mitigate every possible harm that may come out of cannabis. And I know you mentioned um, some, some situations in, in your own personal life that, that you've seen, uh, but we will absolutely do things the right way by the framework that Massachusetts and the town of Berlin have created. And we will not be doing things like trying to appeal to children or sell to minors. We will be uh, working closely with town officials and law enforcement to make sure that everything we're doing is, is working properly and there aren't any adjustments that need to be made. Uh, and, and certainly I take personal responsibility if there's anything that doesn't happen correctly. It is my job to, as a CEO of this company to make sure that we do things correctly it's been me from day one that's been coming to Berlin, that's been meeting with everybody, that's been handling every aspect of this. It's, it's not a, a consultant or a lawyer or whatever it may be. Um, it's my company. I, I stand behind everything that we do. I take a lot of pride in it, actually. Uh, and so we will do everything correctly. I think we're a very high quality group. And, and Berlin as a community has decided to allow cannabis businesses. That was not a choice that we made. But seeing the great opportunity that's there, thinking that we're a good fit uh, for this place, thinking that we found a phenomenal site that's as sort of removed from everything else in the community as any site could really be. Um, these are all the reasons that we're excited about this. And we think that we can come in and be a really positive contributing member of this, of this community. And so um, that will be our approach. That will continue to be my approach. I will continue to be uh, available on a direct basis for for anything that comes up as we go through this process and, and once we start to operate. Uh, but, but beyond that, um, certainly I can appreciate, uh, you know, your, uh, your sort of concerns around cannabis generally, uh, and, and we will do our best to try to mitigate those. Um, Peg has a question, so I'll let Peg go and then Ms. Right. Quinn can join. Go ahead, Peg. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Anchor, given the overwhelming support by the Berlin voters to allow marijuana establishments in our town, uh, could you tell us why the town would want to have your establishment mm -hmm. over any of our other proponents that may come before the town? Yeah, no, thank you, Peggy. Um, 
this goes back to some of what I was just saying. I, I think it should really, if there are two main criteria that I would be employing from the community and from the town standpoint, it is, is the site suitable for the proposed use? And, and is the operator suitable for the proposed use and for the community? And so uh, I'll reiterate this again, from a site standpoint, I have yet in my career to come across a better site for cannabis retail than this one, uh, just because of how tucked away it is, how private it is. Um, typically with cannabis sites, you always have a concern of a nearby sensitive use of some kind uh, that causes a lot of, of consternation. And, and here you just really don't have that. And then second piece of that is the operator. And, and I, again, I believe very strongly in, in our company and what we're doing, how we conduct ourselves. I think we've built a phenomenal leadership team. Um, we have not just thrown this business together, but we've been very deliberate about all the choices that we've made, who the key, uh, the key members of the team are, how we approach things. And so uh, we absolutely feel that we're the, the right fit for this community and, and think that we will uh, uh, you know, be a great member of the corporate community there and, and contributing in a lot of different ways. And so uh, to me, between the site and the operator, uh, I think that what we're proposing makes a lot of sense. And, and certainly the community will, will have their own perspective on that. Um, but the goal of all these, these outreach meetings, these discussions is, is for us to try to communicate a little bit more about who we are, what we're suggesting, and hopefully, uh, hopefully people will agree that, that we are a good fit. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Peg. Seems we have no further questions. Uh, we can, uh, we'll keep the line open. I'll just mention uh, for everybody that is attending, um, we will have a period now for one week where we will continue to take questions and feedback and that, that can be provided uh, through the email address that we had uh, included in the notice. Uh, I believe that uh, Margaret and, and the folks in the, in the town staff would also uh, be willing to take any questions or feedback to pass along to us. Um, so certainly we are, um, we are you know, hoping to continue hearing from people uh, and we'll, we'll have you know, the opportunity to, to provide responses uh, once we receive those questions. So that will go on uh, for another, another week. Um, and certainly we can continue keeping this line open for, for a few more minutes for any, any further questions if people have them. Thank you, Encore. This is this is Margaret. Um, yes, uh, folks are invited to um, to present their questions uh, either directly to uh, the company, or you could ask your questions through us um, in the town, and we can pass those questions along to C3 uh, for their answers. Um, you could do that by emailing either um, selectmen at townofberlin.com or townadmin at townofberlin.com or calling 978-310-5901, uh, and that's the Selectman's office number. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, it appears Miss Quinn's laptop died. And she's back, so I don't know if she... I, I just wanted to apologize. I, you know, I didn't want you to think I got off abruptly. <laughs> but um, yeah, it just froze, so I had to reboot. So I just wanted to thank you um, for addressing so many of my questions and concerns and and I appreciate there's a lot of specifics you can't give just yet um, but I appreciate you you listening to my concerns no, th thank you and, and like I said I I fully appreciate that there are many different perspectives on this whole thing so so thank you and um, you may have missed uh, I mentioned a second ago uh, we will be taking questions and feedback for another week after the meeting and that can be uh, either through email to us, uh, the email that was provided in the notice, or through um, Margaret or the select uh, board office at the town. They can also relay any questions to us. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, it seems that everybody has been, uh, has, has uh, had a chance that wanted to ask a question. So uh, I guess I'll quickly close here. Uh, thank you again to everybody. I know it's a, an evening session. Um, really do appreciate everybody making the time. Um, I, I really encourage anyone that has any follow-ups to, to reach out to us uh, by email or, or uh, and, and it certainly I can even uh, make myself available to chat with anyone if that's helpful uh, as we go further into this process. And, and again, we do really welcome the feedback and, and we wanna have an ongoing dialogue with, with anyone who, in the community who wishes to, to chat with us. So 
so we look forward to hopefully meeting everybody in person uh, when, when opportunity allows and, and hopefully we'll be moving further along into this process. So I think we'll go ahead and uh, close the line now. Thank you, Margaret, as well, for agreeing to be the moderator.